I was pretty determined. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm just going to hop into this. Um, so, welcome everybody to the NOFA conference. I'm um, glad you're glad you're able to find the room. Um, let's just start off with a brief land acknowledgement. Um, this conference. Uh, all right. Cool. All right. This conference is being presented on land that has been stewarded by Indigenous people uh, since before European colonization. Um, as we work to student. As we work to heal the destruction caused by colonization, we appreciate your support, solidarity, and continued learning. If you haven't been on that website, it's a fantastic resource. I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, here are some local um, organizations that help the racial equity work. Um, they're BIPOC-led. Um, if any are in your region, feel free to check them out to get involved with the great cause. Um, I'll just give this up for a couple seconds. So we do have a BIPOC caucus group and a white ally caucus group coming up during the lunch hour. It's going to be 1145 to 145. Um, and we just want to celebrate that restorative agriculture is rooted in a longstanding cultural practice of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in an agricultural system that's been built on stolen land and forced labor with exploitation of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Our conference aims to center equity in the food system. Um, brief moment to thank Stony Field for making this possible. We have a few other sponsors we'll highlight on the next screen and screen after that. All right, cool. Um, anybody's looking for a job, NOFA Mass is hiring. So there's currently a conference coordinator that would be helping coordinate stuff like what's happening right now. There's an administrative director, an assistant development director, and a couple uh, technical assistants. I'm just opening up for another dog, so I don't know who you right now. Um, all right. Uh, okay, there's the online auction. I'm sure you've seen signs all over the place about that. Um, if you can bid, do so. It helps support uh, NOFA and just events like this. Um, and with that, we can hop into the presentation. Uh, my screen sharing and then Kelly go for it. All right. Thank you. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Oh, shoot. All right. Can we see that? Yes. Great. All right. So Hello, everybody. I know I can't really see anybody face to face, but um, hope everyone's doing well. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about biochar on the farm and uh, more specifically exploring the, the uses of biochar um, in organic agricultural settings. So let's hop into it. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so today you'll be hearing from me. I'm Kelly Attenborough. Um, I'm an analyst at Standard Biocarbon and have been working for the company <clears throat> for a little over two years. I, uh, I started out doing a feed, feedstock procurement analysis of Northern Maine and have more recently moved into uh, sales and marketing of the biochar product with my colleague, <clears throat> Tom Horton. Sorry, excuse me. I am a graduate of Bates College with a degree <clears throat> in environmental science and did my senior thesis on biochar production in Maine as a disposal method for residual wood products uh, from the dimensional lumber industry, as well as looking at the potential climate benefits uh, producing biochar in Maine could, could bring to the state. Sorry, oh. Sorry having some technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Um, you'll also be hearing from Tom Horton. Tom is uh, is our CMO and co-founder of Standard Biocarbon. He will be talking about how 
uh, biochar interacts with growing soil. Tom has been in the biochar industry for many years and is what I consider to be kind of a, a biochar guru. Um, he's, you know, an atlas. I hope all the all the technical questions that come through can can be directed towards Tom because he definitely stands the best shot at, at answering those. Um, and finally, we'll be hearing some testimonials from Sam Dixon. Uh, Sam is the dairy farm, farm manager at Shelburne Farms. Sam has experience using biochar and manure management and some insight into um, other biochar applications on the farm. Specifically, Sam will be discussing biochar filters for water quality, biochar use in a dairy farm, uh, and biochar for chickens and compost. Uh, Shelburne Farms is a national leader in the, dem in the demonstration of organic farms. They are located in Vermont and have taken large strides in novel bi biochar application methods. As you will see, uh, Shelburne Farms has not just uh, not just been putting biochar in their soil, but has been using using it in a bunch of different interesting ways. And um, I know Tom and I are really looking forward to to hearing the insight that Sam has to share at the end of this presentation. So here's a uh, here's a brief outline of our presentation and what we'll cover. Um, first, we'll we'll start off with uh, with an overview of our company, Standard Biocarbon. We'll then move into uh, you know getting into what exactly biochar is and how it's made. Tom will will then cover how biochar performs in soils. Uh, I'll I'll provide some some application recommendations and cover the the USDA code three three six that reimburses re, reimburses farmers uh, for increasing their their soil carbon storage. Uh, and then finally, Sam Dixon will uh, show some great photos that he shared with us and uh, and discusses his experience from applying biochar um, at Shelburne Farms. Um, and then we'll we'll save maybe 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. Should there be any, feel free to write them in the chat or just save them in your head and, and we'll we'll get to those at the end. All right. So getting into a little bit about, about the company that Tom and I work for, Standard Biocarbon. Uh, Standard Biocarbon is a startup biochar producer located in Maine. We plan to produce biochar with roughly 90% carbon content, and we have secured a a steady supply of high quality, consistent and verified feedstock for, for biochar production. We're using proven technology from Pyreg, a German manufacturer um, who, who manufactures pyrolysis units with over 30 units operating globally, mostly in Europe. I will get a little more into the into the technical side in a, in a few slides. Um, here in the in these photos here, you can see some of the progress that we've made at our production facility in, in uh, it's located in Enfield, Maine, which is if you're familiar with Maine at all, it's about an hour north of Bangor. Um, we are co-located with the, the Pleasant River Lumber uh, Company's mill, uh, the new spruce, spruce and fir sawmill. It's an extremely high-tech sawmill, and they'll be providing us clean, dry wood chips for feedstock right on site. And we'll be sending them back some, some waste heat uh, for their dimensional lumber kiln drying operations. So you can see here in this photo on the left, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, We've got uh, we've got two uh, Pyreg PX fifteen hundred pyrolyzers located in our production building. We've got a, a plant manager and operational engineer up in Enfield that have been working closely with the Pleasant River Lumber team uh, to make this site come to life. You can see on the right we've we've uh, got a building up, and it was a very exciting day when we got our our uh, our technology in from Germany. So um, things are starting to take shape up there, which is which is really great, and we expect to be. Uh, in full production, full production in November of this year. So here are some uh, some basic uh, facility statistics that we're expecting um, once we're running continuously. We'll be producing roughly 1,500 tons of biochar annually with an average bulk density of 12 and a half pounds per cubic foot. We expect that to come out to around 11,400 cubic yards annually. Um, and the bulk density is, is subject to change depending on the moisture content of the biochar, which can be altered depending on customers' desires, as well as um, particle size. We've, um, we're thinking about putting into place some, some post-processing equipment that can mill the biochar down to, to finer particle sizes, which would increase that bulk density, obviously. Um, this plant will sequester 3,000 tons of, of carbon dioxide equivalent annually uh, based on a pre-production life cycle assessment that we had done. Um, we will also be producing a, a whole bunch of, of waste heat that will eventually either be sent to the sawmill for their kiln drying operation or used to dry green pins and fines for feedstock. Okay. 
So now I'll get a little bit uh, more into the into the pyro pyrolysis technology that we will be using um, the Py the Pyreg PX fifteen hundred. As I mentioned, um, it's a top of the line equipment manufacturer, and they've got a pretty good track record of, of units running over in over in Europe. Um, I'd say that the most unique feature of of this um, of this pyrolysis unit is the high temperature flux burner or the flameless oxidation burner uh, it, that will recycle and burn the hydrocarbons that are emitted from the feedstock as a green energy heat source for continuous biochar production. Uh, this is basically like a highly efficient biomass boiler. Uh, it's so clean that it doesn't even need a scrubber. It just takes those emissions off the wood chips and uh, makes the, the pyrolysis process autothermal. Um, now, I'm no engineer, but I will I'll give it my best shot at walking you through this process diagram. Uh, to explain kind of how these machines work. So first, you can see in the top left over here, um, organic matter, which in our case is, is uh, wood residuals, but some people are using agricultural waste and other things like that, um, is added into the receiver tank, and it is carried to the rotary wheel, wheel sluice. Um, this is the rotary wheel sluice is essentially an airlock where the wood uh, is brought into the machine in the absence of oxygen. Uh, the biochar then grow, goes through the screw auger reactor right here um, at a temperature between 500 and 700 degrees centigrade, so very hot. And uh, the gases from, from the wood get carried through this uh, ceramic process gas filter um, and continues into the flux burner that I was just talking about that, um, that burns at 1,000 degrees centigrade, so even, even hotter. Um, and the heat from that burner is sent back into the reactor to create an autothermal process where once we're up continuously running, we don't have to add any, any propane or any kind of other heat source. It's just the heat coming off the chips that, that continue the process for us. <clears throat> um, you can see at the bottom here, so out of the reactor, um, the biochar is discharged and sprayed with water to avoid combustion. And as I was saying, we can we can adjust the amount of water sprayed into the biochar at the end, depending on what the customer would like. Uh, you're left with biochar that will be uh, that will be bagging in two cubic yard super sacks, and we hope to be able to work with the contract bagger to to provide other options for bagging, such as one or two cubic foot uh, bags of biochar. And last part at the top, um, you can see that the exhaust gas is discharged through the heat exchanger, where where we will be producing low pressure steam heat that could potentially be used for renewable energy production uh, with an ORC generator. As I stated before, our plan as of now is to take that waste steam heat and send it roughly, it's about 300 feet um, to the sawmill for their, their dimensional lumber kiln drying operations. Now I'll play this, I'll play this video. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not good enough explaining it to do it in real time because it's only 27 seconds, but you can kind of see where all the, all the gases and chips go. Um, it is it's pretty interesting to see you know that where it's a very it's a very technologically advanced machine and and we're lucky to be uh working with Byreg to to get some high quality biochar in the hands of New England farmers that's it okay so now uh we'll move into uh, what biochar is and how it interacts with the soil. So here's kind of a very brief overview of biochar. Um, it's been made, it is made through pyrolysis, which I just explained. It's kind of essentially a, a thermal decomposition of biomass, creating a, a near near pure carbon uh, product. It's highly inert, meaning that it will last in soil, last in the soil for thousands of years, thus justifying the fact that it is sequestering the carbon stored in the biomass. Um, and while we're covering the, the use of biochar and organic agriculture today. There's massive potential for the product to be used in other industries as well, such as remediation, whether that be wastewater or harmful chemical cleanup, and some uh, composite materials such as concrete and asphalt. There's really like a just a whole world of, of application types that people are looking into. It's kind of an exciting time to, to be in the industry and, and see what, what interesting ideas people are coming up with. Um, so why biochar? Um, biochar is talked about more and more these days, it's kind of a golden product uh, that can solve many different issues, and, and we, we're totally buying into that. Uh, some of these benefits include biochar being a disposal for waste materials, such as agricultural waste or municipal waste. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, 
we're, we, we're using low grade wood residual products from the Pleasant River Lumber Company's mill for feedstock. Um, Maine has been developing an issue over the past couple of decades where the demand for low grade wood is declining. And this is due to biomass power plants and paper mills shutting their doors and kind of the, the outlets and demand for um, these wood products is decreasing pretty drastically. Um, so we hope that biochar production can kind of step in as a new customer for these products to support the forest products industry as a whole. It's important to note that, that we're not cutting down trees or incentivizing sawmills to cut down trees, rather, rather we're diverting wood that would otherwise be burned for energy or turned into paper and creating a climate positive product with it. Um, and as I was saying, and Tom will get into a little more, there's large environmental benefits that come um, from producing biochar. And essentially biochar sequesters the carbon that's stored in the organic feedstock. And in our case, the wood that we're using to make biochar would otherwise be burned um, for boiler fuel and to produce heat for uh, their, the, the lumber company's uh, kiln drying operation. So we're basically avoiding the carbon from being burned uh, in the boiler and pyrolyzing the material to make it inert as to not release those carbon molecules back into the atmosphere. Um, all right, so now I will hand it over to our, uh, our CMO, Tom Horton. Uh, Tom has worked for, for decades in conservation management uh, for international conservation organizations. He was a program officer at the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. He's been a climate activist for over a decade, and he and his brother Fred founded Standard Biocarbon in 2019. Tom was brought, brought on as the innovation officer specializing in developing applications for biochar. Tom will uh, talk about the characteristics of high quality biochar, how biochar sequesters uh, carbon dioxide and how biochar interacts with the soil to increase soil health and productivity. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you all for uh, taking part of your Saturday to spend with us and learn a bit more about biochar. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be hitting upon a, uh, a, a few themes, and I, I guess before I start, I should mention I'm, I'm not a soil scientist. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, a chemical engineer, um, but I have been working in the, in the biochar industry for almost a decade, and uh, I'm uh, very passionate about regenerative agriculture, um, having worked at Rodale and spent my entire uh, adult life uh, uh, growing food, um, much of what we eat at our home, uh, seasonally we produce here. So um, I really care about, I really care about agriculture uh, in, in New England. Um, so I'm gonna uh, hit a few themes. Uh, those are gonna be around sort of understanding what, uh, what makes high quality biochar high quality, um, what, uh, what farmers uh, should, uh, look at, um, uh, look for when when considering uh, applying biochar on their farm, and uh, what's actually happening in the soil when you put biochar down into into the soil, uh, and um, and and sort of lastly, um, why um, sort of the climate attributes of biochar uh, should be important uh, beyond sort of the obvious fact that we all care about uh, the changing environment. Um, and, uh, so, uh, next slide. So, uh, Kelly reviewed with you, um, I think generally what, um, uh, how biochar is made, uh, but I, I thought I'd talk a little bit, uh, more about, um, sort of, the the chemical process that happens within the kiln when you make biochar. So uh, we are using this uh, this clean, very homogeneous uh, feedstock. It sort of allows us to tune the machine to make very very uh, high quality, very high carbon uh, material. Um, but but broadly, what's happening uh, in the uh, in the uh, machine is that uh, we are heating the biomass above its kindling temperature. Um, in an airless environment, and the volatile organic compounds in wood, um, which is about you know you know on a dry basis about fifty percent of what's in the wood are, are, uh, are volatile you know 
or is organic matter, and that uh, turns into a gas, and that gas um, leaves. And, and when it leaves, it produces, you know, millions of uh, small pores, um, and uh, and uh, the resulting material is this. Uh, if done well, uh, a, a nearly pure carbon material that has a very, very stable in the environment. Um, and it has, a, you know, a lot of surface area. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit why that, why those two characteristics are really important from the soil's perspective. And, uh, you know, in the syngas, uh, we burn very cleanly. You know, some biochar manufacturers, they vinegars or they uh, do other things with that. We, we, Converted to thermal energy, um, but uh, the characteristics of high quality biochar are really driven um, by a couple of things. One is the sort of the quality of the feedstock, uh, and the second is sort of the technology uh, that that you're using. Um, and uh, so, so we end up with this this carbon material. And, and the way to think about biochar is really um, you're buying real estate for the microbiome in your soil. And uh, to give you some sense so of the kind of surface area that, um, that we are producing for the benefit of microbes in the soil, you took one cubic centimeter of biochar and you spread it out flat, uh, long, thin carbon film, uh, you would cover uh, about 400 square meters of space. So that's, you know, a little less than a football field uh, of, of space. And so on that space, that's, you know, that's uh, sort of the condominium complex uh, for your for your soil biome. Um, all right, next. Um, so what, what does good biochar look like? Uh, it has a uh, it has a very high carbon content, and you know that is achieved um, by um, heating the material to higher temperatures. The sort of the higher the temperature, you're, you're, uh, you you can um, uh, you can heat your material um, without obviously you know catching it on fire. Uh, the more of that of those volatile uh, volatiles will drive off, and the more pores and the more surface area you'll end up with. Um, uh, and so the, the uh, diversity of pore structure and the amount of pore structure is related to that, uh, the carbon content in the material. Um, if you have high carbon, you are going to have sort of low everything else. So if you're 80% Carbon, you're 20% um, other residuals in that material. And those resi residuals are either um, um, non carbonized um, organic matter, you know, which are sort of various types of VOCs and pH. And uh, I mean, excuse me, and uh, ash. And that um, ash will change, uh, will lower the pH uh, of the material. And so, in the ideal world, you're buying biochar and for its attributes, and you're um, you're you know you're getting as close to pH neutral as possible, so that you do not have to uh, think about um, what changes you're making in the soil. I mean, uh, you can buy um, limey agent and ash if if that's your goal, and certainly we have acidic soils here in New England, but um, but that's not that's not why you're buying biochar. Um, other attributes uh, uh, are the um, uh, uh, cation exchange capability. And this really is a, a measure of um, how efficient biochar is in um, uh, pulling in and holding on to molecules onto the surface of that of, of that. Uh, of the biochar. So um, it's sort of a measure of the stickiness of your material. And um, that 
is that's really a result of the fact that biochar carries a a very a, a low uh, uh, negative charge, and, um, and so it will pull in molecules, and we'll talk about what those are, and then hold on to them. Um, uh, and then I uh, so, sort of the last thing I'll mention, sort of on the physical characteristics, is the distribution of particle sizes. So. Um, in the, ideally, you have this sort of range of particle sizes because uh, they do will do slightly different things in the soil. Um, if it's too small, it'll it'll uh, reduce uh, sort of the uh, pore uh, and surface area capacity uh, of the material. If it's too large, um, those you, the, the microbes will not be able to penetrate uh, the biochar and um, and um, will not uh, be as effective in the soil. Um, and then I'll you know talk a little bit about sort of on the supplier side what you want to be looking for, um, and and that's really um, source verification. It's it's important to know where that feedstock came from, and um, if, if that's not obvious, I'll explain that um, a lot of the material out in the marketplace it comes out of um, have. Uh, uh, biomass facilities and the process of producing uh, biochar will concentrate any uh, sort of metals contaminants in it. So um, you, you just really want to understand where your material comes from. Um, I think having OMRI and USDA bio-based certificates and so forth, uh, that's great and important and something we'll do. Um, but more important is sort of the willingness of the supplier to test frequently and to um, publish the results and put those results on, on the bag and for the farmer to know when they put it down in the, in the field um, that uh, it's, it, uh, you know, we're doing good. Uh, we're not, we're doing no harm is sort of our first objective um, uh, as, a, as a manufacturer. All right, thanks. So uh, what uh, this is a uh, an actual analysis of of uh, biochar uh, produced with a feedstock from the mill we're going to be locating. We are locating and uh, on a, the bench uh, pyrolysis machine at Pyreg in Germany. And uh, so I'll just go through. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but I'll go through a few of them that I think are important. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the bulk density will sort of tell you it's important because um, it will, uh, one of the things that biochar does in soil is decompact soil. So um, the lower your bulk density, the more of an effect it will have in sort of loosening up um, uh, clay soils and uh, decompacting soils. The, um, the surface area is that when I was talking about sort of the football field of, of, of uh, real estate you're, you're buying for your uh, microbiome, uh, the higher that VET number, the more surface area you have. Um, so that's, you know, basically meters per gram. Uh, and, and there's, a, there's a, a number there. So our biochar was, was showing about 354 meters per gram of biochar, which is, you know, it's a big number. Um, you know, water holding capacity is important because, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, biochar is like a sponge and it will um, hold and retain water uh, in the soil, particularly important um, when you are in a drought environment or a low, low moisture environment, it'll um, uh, keep enough water in the soil uh, to keep your plants alive and probably more importantly, the microbiome in the soil alive. Um, I think I already sort of mentioned the ash content, which you know you um, you're buying biochar for the attributes of the biochar and and, and not the attributes of the ash. So uh, a low ash number uh, is is important. And I think um, to me the most important metric with biochar is the carbon content um, because that you know, that higher carbon content means there is not uh, residual um, non-pyrolyzed wood leaving VOCs in the, in the soil. And I'll talk a little bit about what 
why that's important from a soldier's perspective. And um, and uh, the you know higher quality, higher quality material you're going to have, and also the residency time in soil, how long it will last and be persistent in the soil. Um, all right, next. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, biochar is it's sort of like a magnet or a filter that sort of lives in your soil and lives in your soil permanently. Um, uh, and that um, magnetic um, um, capacity is really related to um, this uh, the uh, a few different factors. You know, one is that, that sort of that physical absorption, the ability to just soak stuff up um, like a sponge, literally like a sponge. Um, uh, part of it is that sort of surface area. Once it's soaked up, a place for those molecules to reside, to land and and stay. Uh, and um, sort of the third is this sort of uh, stickiness factor. This, uh, which is a the metric, is this uh, uh, um, cation exchange capacity, which. Um, in part is uh, uh, driven by this sort of the electrical uh, magnetic, uh, literally literal magnetic uh, component of the biochar. So uh, ion groups in, uh, in the soil or in the inoculants, which Kelly will talk a little bit uh, uh, in a little while about, um, they are pulled in and those generally have a positive charge. So potassium, Magnesium, uh, ammonia, nitrogen uh, through uh, ammonia, all of these things, uh, important plant uh, nutrients will stick and stay in there. Uh, and also a range of biological um, components, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so uh, you basically have this sort of world within a world. Uh, and Imagine that you know in a very small space you can store a football field of surface, so you're dramatically increasing sort of the ability to have uh, 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 a healthy microbiome in your soil. So, a lot going on in a very small space. Um, and you know the two other things reasons sort of it's important uh, uh, is that. Um, it also uh, uh, attracts and holds uh, uh, various um, uh, uh, pollutants and uh, contaminants in the soil. So heavy metals also have a positive charge, actually a little bit a larger positive charge. They will stick to the inside and they will stay in the biochar. And so uh, that's sort of the filtration uh, capability, and that would be true of PFAS, and there's lots of studies that show that biochar will lock up PFAS, and actually microbes will ultimately break down PFAS. So it takes it, sequesters it, and then and then will ultimately be broken down. Um, and uh, that, you know, um, insecticides, herbicides, other things that um, sadly are sort of persistent in the environment, uh, biochar will help um, mitigate the effects of those uh, in the soil. Uh, in essence, protecting your, your soil bio. Uh, and the last is that um, if you're using and adding uh, organic uh, amendments to your soil, um, and this is particularly true with sandy soils, it will uh, intercept and hold on to those and, and not allow them to wash through, and then allow the, that sort of microbiome community within the biochar to, to break that down. And, and generate uh, soil nutrients uh, that the plants require. Okay, next. Um, so, um, so sort of uh, going in a little bit further. I've put a you know a a uh, more magnified picture of what biochar looks like. Um, and so, what's really happening uh, in biochar is that a um, a film, a, a living film is forming on the outside of the biochar. This is sometimes called the biochar coating or biochar-derived organic matter. 
And this is sort of the community of microbes and funguses and nematodes and all of those things that you really want to have persistent in your soil and that have a range of impacts um, at the root level, which, you know, again, I'm not a soil scientist, but um, um, as far as you, you understand that there's a very complex uh, sort of biological um, interface between soil and roots and, and, and the microbiome. And uh, this is sort of a very protected environment. Bajar holding onto water allows uh, there to be consistently enough moisture for that community to, to stay very healthy. Um, it uh, allows a lot of organic matter and organic nutrients to basically stick and stay in there. Um, and it creates a, it sort of a supercharges the nutrient cycling within soil. And biochar, if you put it in very healthy soil, you know, you're not going to notice really many effects other than it'll add to soil carbon, it will decompact your soil. But, you know, in terms of productivity, um, it, you know, you're not going to see it, uh, though I would encourage you to do it anyway, because it has a, you know, long-term effect, long-term buffering effect uh, in soil. Uh, but if you put it in degraded soil, um, it will very rapidly allow you to put that soil into productivity because you're, you're basically creating that structure that sort of has been washed out or degraded over time. You're sort of introducing this sort of, as I said, sort of world within a world of, 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 uh, of a healthy um, uh, microbial biome. And um, yeah, so next slide. So, um, you know, when I, spoke with farmers, you know, uh, uh, they very often sort of separate sort of the, you know, their um, general concern around, um, around climate and climate change to sort of what's happening on the ground in the farm. And, you know, obviously there's a great awareness out there, growing awareness of the impact of, of climate change and farmers, and particularly small scale farmers are sort of it are going to be the first impacted in the you know the least able to sort of uh, make adjustments uh, ability to you know move or throw uh, invest in in lots of, uh, of uh, amendments or change their business operations and so um, biochar is a very important way to build climate resiliency into the farm so it allows, you know, for instance, uh, plants to survive shock events because really what happens during a shock, heat shock event in the soil is there's the lack of moisture and that's, you know, that's tough on plants, but they can recover. What they cannot recover from is the die off of the microbiome in the soil. And that's typically what happens is the plants, you know, will die literally because they're starving to death because they, there's just not enough biological activity in the soil. And so one way to think about biochar is to think of it as sort of an insurance policy uh, where if you have uh, both, you know, wash through of nu nutrients because of heavy flooding or shock events, it's a way to hold that nutrient uh, uh, in the soil and allow your plants to, uh, to recover. And, um, and then there's sort of uh, there's sort of the economic side of the application of biochar. Uh, um, you, most organic farmers know that organic certification is really important to consumers. It adds value. It 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 uh, it, um, it creates a uh, a economic draw. Um, that you know has been very well measured and very uh, well understood. Less understood is is the the value that consumers are attaching to authentic uh, climate certifications, and um, those studies are really just starting, but they're they are significant. And, and actually, in terms of the broad consumer base, um, 
much more concern around climate and climate branding than organic branding. And so um, I would argue that uh, it's really important to sort of attach that uh, authentic branding and authentic story if you're using biochar, you know, pair that with your uh, regenerative and, and organic agriculture um, uh, branding. Okay, next. Um, so there's a fair amount of material already out there uh, uh, in the marketplace, and um, it's very, you know, it's very confusing for uh, for farmers. And the reason is that you know for you know, for decades, you could go out uh, and, and farmers have been using high, high carbon fly ash uh, and just fly ash for liming. And, um, and, and that has, has, there's a lot of reasons why that, you know, makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's, it, it, you know, that, that sort of concentrating of, of potassium and other uh, positive elements in high carbon fly ash uh, is, uh, is is real and it's important as I mentioned we have acidic soils here in New England um, uh, but um, uh, recently you know people have been taking sort of the carbon side of that putting in a bag and, and labeling as biochar and I, I think it's important to understand that um, it, it's it's a different material and that this material is sort of coming out of the tailpipe of big you know power plants uh, it's not a well-regulated uh, industry, so there is not source verification uh, of the material. Um, there's a high level of variability uh, in the ash content and of, of what's been carbonized and not been carbonized. Um, and uh, so in Europe, um, biochar is a regulated material. It's um, Producers uh, that want to call them their material biochar need to have it tested at a single lab. It's graded, you know, the very highest quality biochar it can be fed to cattle, and it's basically food grade, or to and uh, or for a dietary a dietary supplement. Um, and then each grade sort of has a place inside of the marketplace, and that is clearly labeled on a bag. Um, and it's also tested for heavy metals, it's tested for other contaminants so that users are very clear on what they're buying. And, and we're a younger industry, so that will come, but it's not there yet. And so it's really, the onus is on the farmer uh, to uh, understand what they're buying, to ask questions, uh, to um, be cautious. I mean, if the PFAS, Situation uh, in the Northeast has taught us anything. It's it's that you know we all need to do our own homework and we all need to be very cautious about what we, what we put down uh, because once it's down, uh, it cannot be picked back up again. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing I would say about um, the difference between a, a high carbon fly ash or power plant generated biochar and Purpose made by Achar um, is that, uh, um, and, and that sort of carbon content that I talked about is, and a lot of this material uh, that's coming through, there's a significant component that is not fully uh, carbonized. And, you know, uh, that in that uncarbon, non carbonized uh, part, um, there are uh, various volatiles, and some of those are, are, you know, can have soil toxicity. So, um, bacteria will break down almost everything. It'll break down these things, and that'll all be neutralized. Um, but it's really important to uh, to um, understand uh, uh, what you're buying. Um, be cautious. Uh, be curious. And, um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Kelly and Sam. You know. Kelly's going to talk a, more about uh, how it's actually uh, used uh, on the farm and how to apply it. And, and then Sam will share um, the experiences at Kelvin Farms. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, 
All right, so um, this slide essentially kind of ties in what Tom was just talking about to how biochar interacts with the soil. Um, so biochar allows farmers to utilize overworked or degraded soils, and that's by improving soil structure, enhancing water retention, increasing nutrient retention, um, and in turn redu reducing um, nutrient leaching. It also promotes microbial activity and, and regulates the pH, as, as Tom was just saying. Um, so to briefly recap, biochar acts as a soil conditioner to improve soil health. Uh, it helps in, in reducing the density of clay soils and in, in turn uh, improves water and air movement within the soil. It's also useful in sandy soils as it increases the structure of the soil, uh, therefore kind of present, preventing the wash through and um, lowers that, that perk rate. So it, it adds some, some real structure to those sandy soils. Um, Biochar also increases water retention in soils as it has a low, uh, a low density, it's extremely porous, as you saw in some of those photos, uh, which enables the soil to retain water and nutrients. You can kind of think of biochar as a sort of sponge uh, that'll hold on to the water and nutrients well in your soil. Biochar has a high cation exchange capacity, as Tom was mentioning, uh, and it's got that that massive surface area that's negatively charged and allows the biochar to hold on to nutrients like potassium, uh, calcium, magnesium, things like those. And this this really helps uh, in nutrient depleted soils as it'll make them uh, more fruit more fertile with nutrients and nutrients that are available to the crop at the root level. Uh, in a similar vein, biochar will reduce nutrient leaching from soils since it traps the nutrients in its porous structure, avoiding the, the potential for nutrients to leach through the soil into the groundwater. Um, Tom used, used that, uh, that great analogy that biochar kind of acts like a, like a condominium for microbial life. Um, and it through that, it, it supports the soil health and, and nutrient cycling. It could also have a liming effect, um, as Tom was talking about. Uh, it can raise soil pH in, in acidic soils and buffer it with alkaline soils, and this creates a more balanced and suitable pH level for, for plant growth. Uh, so at all, biochar does reju rejuvenate degraded soils, uh, enhances uh, fertility, and promotes sustainable agricultural practices, which leads to improved crop yields and, and better soil health over the long run. Um, so biochar does require inoculation to work well in the soil. There are kind of a variety of application methods for field crops, um, such, as, such as broadcast spreading, sowing at the root level or injecting it with a, in a slurry. But regardless of the application method, it's widely recommended that the user inoculates or charges the biochar before application. Um, inoculation essentially means blending the biochar with a biologically active agent, such as fish emulsion or composted manure. Um, really kind of any biological agent that is rich with beneficial microorganisms and nutrients uh, in the biochar world, which is growing. Uh, this is often referred to as activation or charging of the biochar. And Do you have any experience using biofertilizer, the effluent um, produced by biodigesters with biochar? Um, we do not have any firsthand experience. Um, Using that as as a inoculant, since you know we we haven't actually produced any product yet, so we've we've been exploring some different fish emulsions that are available to us and some other uh, compost teas and things like that. But um, I'm sure if it if it's got a lot of biological activity, it would be a great inoculant. Yeah, I'm just so curious because you know the different compost teas have different microbial compositions and pHs. Um, yeah, it'd be it'd be fun to see some data on that. Or where are you guys located? Are you here in Western Mass? No, we are. Um, so we've got offices in Portland, Maine, and our production site is in Enfield, Maine. Uh, okay. We're pretty much all based out of Maine, yeah. Cool. Okay, thanks. No worries. Thanks for the question. Um, where was that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so biochar will also improve nutrient availability to crops, making nutrients more accessible in the soil. Um, it'll also increase plant growth given beneficial microbes, uh, promote plant growth and crop uh, and crop activity. Um, and finally, inoculated biochar will actually sequester more carbon in the soil through increased microbial activity and organic matter decomposition. So the inoculant that that a producer chooses to mix with their biochar obviously depends greatly on their local soil conditions. and and we suggest that farmers experiment as we were just saying, experiment with different inoculants to determine uh, which is best for their specific use. So 
So here we'll, we'll cover some uh, some very basic generalizations about uh, biochar application. Um, I would assume that this goes without saying, but uh, application rates vary based on soil type and crop type. Um, when considering what application to use, key factors include soil texture, organic matter content, and uh, and soil drainage. For general guidelines, uh, we suggest you apply around 10 to 15 percent biochar by volume to sandy soils, 5 to 10 percent biochar by volume to loamy soils, and 2 to 5 percent um, by volume to, to clay soils. So when mixing biochar with soil, uh, we thoroughly uh, we suggest thoroughly mixing the biochar with the top six or six to eight inches of soil uh, while avoiding concentrated application areas. So, you know, it gets spread out real nice. Um, and as we mentioned on the last slide, we, we suggest inoculating the biochar with, yeah, compost, compost tea, something, something that's, that's biologically active. Um, timing is also an important consideration. It's best to apply biochar before planting or during the growing season to allow microbial activity uh, to interact with the biochar before planting. Applying biochar in the fall uh, before the winter is also an option to give the biochar, um, you know, the maximum amount of time to interact with the soil microbial life prior to that that spring planting period. Um, so here are some some basic specific uh, crop specific recommendations. For tomatoes, we suggest uh, using about one to two cups of biochar per plant. Lettuce and other leafy greens call for one cup per square foot, and root vegetables call for around two to three cups per square foot. Uh, we do need to in input a disclaimer here that uh, overall application can, or sorry, over application can be detrimental to crop crop productivity. Excessive biochar application will negatively affect nutrient availability, as they'll all stick to the biochar and not be available to the to the crops roots. Um, so we suggest starting with recommended rates and, and observing plant response from there. And uh, like any like any new input, it's important to observe the performance of initial applications uh, to make changes in future implementations of the product. So the new slide. Um, so how much does uh, or Tom, did you want to step in here and speak to this one? Oh, sure. I, I, I'm sorry, I slipped this one in, Kelly, at the last minute. Um, so uh, farmers often ask sort of, what, what are the economics of, of applying biochar? What can I expect in terms of, uh, in, uh, you know, improved productivity? Um, and it's a, a very complicated um, discussion because the it's driven by the um, soil type, the soil condition, the crop type, um, the inoculant, um, but, you know, very broadly, you know, sort of out in the marketplace biochars, I would say here in the Northeast, um, uh, this is sort of purpose-made biochar, high carbon biochars is, is sort of between two and 350 a cubic yard. Um, and it, you know, if you are applying it to very degraded soils, I think you can have very dramatic improvements in productivity. Um, and um, you really only need to apply it to the root level. So generally speaking, you don't have to spread it all over the entire field. You can, you can, you know, sow it uh, at, you know, uh, at the time of planting at the root level. So, um, you know, the application rates can be really pretty low um, in in aggregate, you know, sort of two to four cubic yards and it's sort of increased by the amount of uh, sort of inoculant you're using. So all of this translates depending on what crop and how much you're putting down sort of in the four to $1,500 per acre um, uh, plus the inoculation and labor cost of doing it. Um, and, you know, it's important to remember that it is persistent in the soil forever. So the benefits really, you know, very often the studies that have been done are looking at one or two years, you know, three years at most after application. And the and the, and really, you really need to go and look at how much water label, uh, uh, water uh, amendment savings um, uh, and uh, uh, crop improvements over a long period of time to, to get a real sense of it. But um, the 
the long-term benefits are, are, are significant. Okay, Kelly. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about biochar and manure management on the farm. Um, I think Sam Dixon is, has, has the most experience with this, so looking forward to hearing what, what he's got to say. Um, so some benefits that you will see from, from biochar being used for manure management uh, are that adding biochar to manure helps improve nutrient retention and reduce nutrient leaching. Uh, this is true in more nutrient-rich compost that can be uh, used as a valuable soil amendment. Biochar's porous structure that we've been talking about a lot aids uh, in moisture management, reducing the, reducing the risk of runoff and potential environmental contamination. Biochar can also be used uh, in bedded pack management to improve composting efficiency and reduce odors. In a, in a bedded pack, biochar enhances the absorption of ammonia and other volatile compounds, which reduces odors, and um, it also reduces some livestock, uh, you know, hoofborne diseases, infections, things like that. Um, biochar can be used in, manu in manure retention ponds to, pro to promote nutrient sequestration and improve water quality. Uh, the, the product's ability to retain nutrients and prevent leaching can reduce the risk of eutrophication and algal blooms. Uh, biochar is also being used in livestock facilities to manage fly populations. It has the ability to absorb moisture and nutrients and disrupt fly breeding, fly, fly breeding habitats. Uh, the reduction noter can, can help deter flies from laying eggs in manure and compost piles. And finally, as I've mentioned, biochar absorbs and traps uh, odorous compounds, reducing foul smells on the farms. Um, and we hope that this improves the working environment for the farmer. So I realize that we're we're running up on started a little late, so we're running up on our on our time limit. But I'll try to work through these last few slides and get to Sam as quick as I can. Um, uh, biochar can be used for point and non-point uh, source pollution applications on on livestock farms to intercept nitrates, phosphates, and other nutrients that should not be spilled over into the waterways. Uh, this is this is an in an effort to mitigate water pollution and eutrophication, which means excessive uh, nutrient enrichment leading to algae blooms and oxygen depletion. Biochar uh, can act as kind of a sponge and filtering material as it can capture these excess nutrients, which, uh, which stops the nutrients from entering waterways. And once the biochar is fully saturated, the, the material can uh, be picked up and reapplied on agriculture as kind of a natural fertilizer, um, thus kind of recycling those nutrients back into the soil. And as Tom was mentioning earlier, not all biochars are created equal, and its uh, ability to capture and store nutrients can vary greatly on the production process and also the feedstock and its application method. So we advise proper consideration, choose a, choose a high carbon biochar that, um, you know, doesn't have a whole lot of other ingredients in it. Now I'll quickly uh, jump into USDA code 336. This is kind of a really exciting topic for us. Um, so the, the NRCS USDA code 336 soil carbon amendment for biochar funding um, has recently changed from, from, code three, from code 808 to code 336, meaning that it was a practice code, now it's in place, and states uh, are able to adopt uh, the code and begin reimbursing farmers who land apply biochar to to improve their soil carbon storage. And this is kind of just the, the front page of, of Code 336. I'll jump quickly through here. Um, these are states that um, have adopted the, the USDA Code 336. And since it's such an extremely new code, um, there aren't many applications that we can look at right now to, to see what's been working well or not. But um, thankfully, it's being adopted uh, pretty pretty well over the, over the entire United States and especially in our Northeast region, which, which we're very excited about. And if somehow you're from somewhere else that's not part of the states that have adopted it, we suggest going to your local NRCS office and, and trying, to, trying to lobby for, for them to get it in place because we've worked with our NRCS offices and they've been, they've been really nice to us. Um, just some some final touches on the on the code three three six. It's necessary for a producer to consult with the NRCS certified technical service provider or TSP as they like to call them uh, to develop a farm plan that will determine the application rate of biochar inoculated with compost to apply to their land. Uh, farmers will then be reimbursed for the biochar that is applied to the land for up to one hundred and seventy dollars per cubic yard. This payment 
will be made after the application. So the upfront cost of the biochar will have to be recognized by the producer. Um, and the, the TSP will, will identify resource concerns such as low soil carbon, high nitrogen loss, or low microbial activity, and, and so on. Um, there's a very basic overview of the code, and it's it's pretty nuanced, and there's a lot of different structures to to paybacks and uh, you know application methods and things like that. So uh, there was a great webinar that was put on by the the U.S. Biochar Initiative, where NRCS members and biochar producers got together and presented on the rollout of the code. So I suggest heading there. It's on their YouTube page. Probably should add a link, but if you just just look up U.S. Biochar Initiative um, Code 336 webinar, it'll it'll pop up on on their website. And now um, I'd like to welcome uh, Sam Dixon of Shelburne Farms. As I mentioned earlier, Sam is a dairy, dairy farm manager at Shelburne Farms and um, has some practical experience with applying biochar. So Tom and I are, are really, really interested in, uh, in hearing what, what your experience has been. And, and with that, you can take it away, Sam. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Kelly. So uh, Shelburne Farms is a... Uh, uh, not-for-profit educational institution, uh, historic site and working farm uh, along the shores of Lake Champlain, just outside of Burlington in Vermont. Uh, we have a uh, lot of activities on the farm. People can certainly go to our website and see all the things that are going on here. But the heart of the place really is the working farm. We have 120 uh, milking cows make about 85% of the milk we produce into cheddar cheese on the farm. Also have a working forest and sugar bush, uh, about 2,300 taps, and a uh, very active uh, vegetable operation. Uh, we call it the market garden that uh, I think Josh is running about seven to eight acres with two to three acres in production every year. We also have an inn and restaurant on the farm that uses a lot of the produce from the, the vegetable farm. So we started our first uh, use of biochar was maybe eight years ago or so. We were working with a class from UVM around some of the water quality issues we have here. Uh, we've got two miles of lakefront. So our, we've very, been very concerned about the farm's impact on the lake and, and how we can, you know, change our management practices to improve water quality. And one of the ideas was to use a, a biochar filter in one of the main drainages coming from the dairy site. Mm -hmm. And so we did it, we did it. We constructed a little uh, dam and put some biochar in and, and monitored what happened. And it, it had a very positive impact on removing a lot of nutrients uh, very quickly, but it quickly became charged, you know, and uh, I guess it's like it was full. Um, and we are still grappling with the best way to remove that stuff and get new stuff in and sort of redesign the system to make it more uh, practical and, and how to get the biochar out and then put new stuff in and then recycle that biochar. So that was our first experience with it. Uh, the second uh experience was around uh the dairy and uh, we were concerned with uh the odors coming from the manure pit but also the farms uh, on a uh, uh got a long-term goal of getting to uh carbon drawdown so that we are uh trying to reduce the uh greenhouse gas emissions from the farm and and you know the dairy is obviously a large part of that uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and so we were thinking of using the biochar, considering ways to use the biochar to reduce the emissions from the manure. And the first, first opportunity we took was to actually cover the manure pits with biochar, create a permeable cover uh, on the on the manure pits, and uh, hopefully, you know, reduce some of that greenhouse gas and the nitrous oxide emissions from the the pit. And so we got a load of 100 yards of biochar from Quebec, in uh, that was in 2019. And it came down, I believe it was a byproduct from charcoal manufacturer, came down from Quebec, uh, 
truck backed up to the manure pit, opened up the, the gate, and it really just like spread out like magic across the, across the top of the pit and immediately cut the odor on, on the, uh, uh, from coming from the manure pits. And to me, that was an indication that it was having a really positive impact on reducing those greenhouse gas emissions. Some of the things we noticed uh, about that biochar product was it was much larger flakes, like uh, almost like very small chunks of charcoal. And we the biochar appealed to us because we didn't have to buy any additional equipment. We could handle the liquid manure with all the addition, with all the equipment we have on the farm. And 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 when we spread the uh, the manure, I noticed those flakes out on out on the fields. Um, very, you know, they sort of maintain their integrity. Our concerns with using this stuff from Quebec was it's from 11 hours away. And it wasn't clear what level of deforestation was involved with the production of this biochar. And it, and it was very expensive to bring it all the way down from Canada, get it across the border. And uh, so we, that was the one experience we had with that. And then the, the next experience was to actually get some of that same material from Quebec. And every day after we cleaned the barn, uh, uh, to shake some biochar out on the barn floor to kind of mix it in at the cow level. We did install a gas monitor in one of the barns to try to get an idea of whether it was having any impact, but it wasn't uh, very scientific and the barn was is wide open. And uh, it, we didn't get good data from that. We got a lot of data, but that was hard to interpret. Um, we did notice that it turn the manure black and the cow's ho hooves tended to mix it right in. And then when it was scraped out into the manure pit, the, the biochar did float to the surface and form a, a, uh, a cover on the um, manure pit, similar to when we just dumped it in. So my concern is, was just around the labor of doing that uh, every day, adding an extra step to an already busy chore routine. Um, and we didn't have any uh, covered storage for the biochar. So it would have had to sit outside in all the weather all year. And it just, it didn't seem like it was practical. Um, and so we didn't, so then a couple of years went by and we uh, got very concerned about the, you know, how we could address the, the climate change issues around the dairy. And we got uh, some material from a uh, power plant in New Hampshire. I think we can go to the, maybe the next slide, a couple pictures. And this, this came from an hour and a half away in New Hampshire. And uh, it's more of the fly ash type material that Tom was talking about. It is a byproduct from power generation. However, my understanding from the plant that it's coming from is they burn whole trees. Uh, and so they're not getting construction debris and there's no concern with heavy metals or anything like that. But it's also an older plant that doesn't have some of the, the extra scrubbers or I, I, I'm a bit of a novice on that, but uh, it's, it's more, uh, more biochar like and less fly ash like if you if you will um so so we can just go through the this is the, the truck coming and dumping it in the pit we can go to the next slide and then this was different material it did not spread out like that stuff from quebec it was pointed out to me that the stuff from quebec might have uh had more oil in it and and had been more uh more likely to float on the surface. This came out in clumps. And so we got our manure pump and we mixed it in. And you can go to the next slide. And this is it mixing in as, as we had to agitate the, the biochar to, to spread it out and, and mix it in with the surface, uh, across the surface. And go to the next, next slide. This is just it mixing in this that same day when we did this in May at the beginning of the season, because my understanding was most of the uh, uh, nitrous oxide emissions come from your manure pits uh, in the summer months. Basically, it, it, 
when it's frozen, it, there's, you don't get as many admissions. And then we can go to the next slide. And this is the, what the material looked like. And uh, so we, we did that in 2022 and we did it again this year. Uh, this year, however, I made a, a, an attempt to draw the pits down before we, we spread. We had some great weather in April and we were able to spread quite a lot of manure early in the season. It was dry. It's hard to remember back then when it was dry, but it was dry and it was good going for spreading. And we drew the, the pits down pretty significantly. So we got a, a thicker crust that, uh, uh, but we still had to mix it in. Um, we, we, we've, you know, we've had a couple years of spreading this. We have uh, some manure samples. It does, some of the manure samples do show maybe a, a little higher nitrogen level, but we're really just at the beginning of this process and evaluating its effects on the fields and on the soil. Uh, it's gonna take time. Uh, it takes time to move the soil, particularly in, in uh, you know, uh, on a grass farm with manure apps, applications like we are, it's just going to take time to, to evaluate its effect on uh, the pastures and the hay and the hayland. So then the net we can go to the next picture, I think. So the 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 next applications we have is at, at the uh, vegetable farm, the market garden. And Josh is using the by but biochar in two different ways on, on the vegetable farm. The picture on your right is some coarser, uh, more charcoal-like material that he was using to bed uh, his chickens. Uh, he has about 300 laying hens and he pastures them, but they, are, they do go into winter housing. So he was using the biochar to cut the odor and uh, to prove, improve the environment and also as a a chance to mix the biochar in with the chicken manure that would that would then go the picture on the left is from his composting operation and he composts uh using uh uh chicken manure uh and heavily bedded uh uh horse manure from a neighboring horse farm some dairy manure waste hay uh, all different other things. And then he started adding biochar. I think we can go to the next picture. This is him getting the same material that we used at the dairy that he's now mixing in with his compost. And the, the, the final ingredient that is in his compost is, is food scraps from the inn. And so he's adding the biochar. He said he's using it like 10 to 15% by volume he's adding to his uh, compost. And he's just started that this year. So we will be able to you know, evaluate uh, the change in the compost, uh, uh, you know, sort of for the next, the next season as he's, as he's making it this year, he'll be applying it next year. So those, that's really our experience uh, with it. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the budget concerns that uh, Tom talked about, uh, you know, had the expense of the biochar, the way I, I looked at it was uh, as a soil amendment and fertilizer. So if uh, it's improving the quality of our manure, it's an improving the, uh, uh, you know, the, microbiome of the soil and making our soil better, um, then that then I'm looking at it as fertilizer. So I just shifted money from like the fertilizer budget to the uh, to biochar. So that's how sort of I, I, I looked at it. Um, the, in terms of the the 336 uh, program that Kelly was talking about, we actually have applied for that. Uh, we missed our, our deadline for it this year, but we've applied for it for next year. But I'm, I'm not sure that we will uh, 
be eligible because we already have really high organic matters in our soils and our soils. We've been rotationally grazing for close to 50 years and keep the whole farm in a permanent sod and I have really, you know, excellent soil health to begin with. So we don't, whether they can say we have degraded soils or not, and we need the carbon, our, our average organic matter is, you know, over 6%. So we're already working with really high carbon soils. Um, one of the things we obviously are going to have to watch is not putting too much on, um, but I'm, we've got a lot of land, so I, I'm, I'm not concerned about that so much. The other area I would really, I'm very interested in exploring is using biochar as a feed supplement. One to reduce methane emissions from the cows and also as sort of a, for, to improve the, their, their health and their, you know, bind up some of the toxins that maybe we get in molds from our round bales um, and, and just improve the animal's health in addition to reducing the, the methane emissions by improving their, their, their digestion. So that's really our experience with it. Uh, we're, we're, we're committed to continuing to try to use the, uh, the biochar and uh, uh, I'd like to integrate it some way into our bedded pack management for our young stock housing. But again, it's getting back to that, those logistics issues are, we already have a very labor intensive way of bedding our packs and add another step of, of more, more work is we've got to find a better way of, of integrating it. But I'm also very interested in adding it at that point too. So that's really our, our experience here on the farm. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. I think we'll, uh, I don't know if we've got any lingering questions in the chat or I haven't been looking. I don't know if Tom, you've been checking it out or anything from people in person. <clears throat> well, the one question that, uh, that was asked in, in the conversation and in the chat was about uh, digestate, uh, using digestate as a, an inoculant. And uh, I have not seen it done here in the United States. Maybe it has been done, uh, but it's a common practice in Europe to add it uh, to the um, digester. Uh, and it actually, there are studies that show it will improve the methane production up to 15%. Um, and then of course it comes back out the other side as digestate. And it's really ready for field application where applying digestate, you know, without biochar um, may not be. So uh, yeah, there's economic modeling around that. There's some great studies. I'm happy to share, uh, share those studies with folks that are interested. We have another question about the shelf life. Before it's applied. Oh, what's yeah, before it's applied. Shelf life. I'm going back to look at the, the questions here. Uh, so well, what's, what, was, what was the question on shelf life? I, not uh, just what the shelf life before uh, biochar applied is. Well, uh, you know, in the ideal world, you would take your biochar and then uh, inoculate it with, uh, with a, um, you know, something biologically active that can be, um, you know, manure or emulsion, and then you let it sit. Imagine, you know, these, you want, you want the, um, the, both the sort of the biological matter and the uh, microbes to sort of populate that. So, you know, it's like move-in day um, at the dorm. They, you know, you take some time for that to happen. Uh, and uh, then once it's been inoculated, uh, it'll it'll sit for years in that inoculated form if you um, have enough inoculant. And then and then um, uh, the biochar before it's been inoculated can sit indefinitely. I mean, the only re only real way to break down biochar uh, uh, is to burn it or put it through some other chemical process. It's nearly pure carbon, so uh, it's you know. C, you can't, it cannot be further reduced uh, without the application of some uh, thermochemical or chemical process. Okay. Any other questions? 
All right, I think that's all the questions from the people uh, watching in person. Great. Let's see if we got any more in the chat. Pretty good. Pretty nice lunchtime, so. <laughs> I think it's. Yeah. Don't see any new ones, I think. I thought I saw one pop up in the chat. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, the, can you talk about some of the differences in quality and application of industrial biochar versus small batch? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think that uh, people are making very high quality biochar in small batches. Um, and uh, for me, it's not sort of a, a question of scale. It's, a, it's, it's really um, the ability to understand what the carbon content in the material is. So um, uh, a lot of the small batch suppliers don't have the resources or capability to actually test the biochar, understand sort of what it looks like after it's done. Uh, uh, high carbon fly ash, you can put a pile of that next to a pile of biochar and it looks exactly the same. You know, it's black. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do a few things. You can sort of, uh, uh, Sam talked about some of the oils. So if your biochar is not fully cooked, not fully processed, and it's uh, not um, um, carbonized uh, organic uh, volatiles, you can rub it between your fingers. And if there, you know, if there's a film left on your fingers, uh, you know that your biochar probably, you know, needs to go back in the oven, so to speak. Um, it's not, it's not fully carbonized. Uh, but the only real way to know the carbon content is, you know, to send it off to a lab. And, and uh, the only way to know that it doesn't have, um, you know, heavy metal contaminants. So if you, when you make biochar, you know, it's basically, you know, five to one, five parts um, uh, biomass to one part biochar. So you're you're doing a five times concentration of you know of anything that is left that's not carbon, uh, and uh, so so those are the kind of concerns that um, I think folks should have. Though if you're taking you know you're on a farm and you're taking your woody biomass and you're processing it on the farm, you know what it is uh, and you know, there's not terrible downsides to putting, you know, not fully carbonized wood on the uh, uh, on your garden. You know, it'll take some time for it to break down. There's all kinds of positives, you know, phosphates and other other things that bugs like in your in your garden. And and you know, here in New England, your soil's very likely to be acidic. So, you know, you're probably going to have some 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 positive uh, results. So, as a climate activist. I say, if you can put biochar down on the ground, um, you're not doing harm. Uh, the more different ways uh, uh, folks can do it, the better it is. Um, we, sort of the promise we have as an organization uh, is to guarantee to the buyer, this will have you know a specific carbon content. It'll have a specific ash content. I can tell you where that chip of wood came from. Uh, it, you can buy it with, with confidence, and um, uh, we think that's sort of the pathway to grow the industry is, is sort of around truth and labeling um, uh, and sort of uh, quality guarantees. Yeah, I think like the angle I'm coming from is, you know, I think in, in industrialized countries, it makes a lot of sense to do centralized processing. Um, and then, and indeed, that's like the most of biogas is here in the U.S., but there are there's definitely a niche for small scale biogas in the U.S. and especially in less industrialized countries. Um, and there's like I'm sure you're aware there's there's big movements in arid parts of the world to change the soil structure so that it can both hold more water and hold more. Um, uh, potential for agricultural yields, you know, be it growing plant crops or um, grazing livestock. And just, you know, just traveling in Sicily and in other parts of Southern Italy, 
it, it's such a common practice for people to burn their brush piles, you know, the, especially the, the tree crops are really big there, you know, citrus and olive and mm -hmm. some other crops. And it's just a very widespread practice to just burn all the trimmings. They're heavily pruned annually. And, you know, of course the burning is like, it releases a ton of carbon, but it's also a huge loss. You know, it's like a, it's like, um, I don't think it's the capturing the full yield. And also sure. the, there's a lot of escaped wildfires that happen. It's a, it's a huge, actually a huge problem. And it's not just Sicily, you know, it's like, uh, I would say Northern Africa and across the Mediterranean, there's similar practices. And I just found it so interesting, you know, I'm have a relationship with that place and I'm, you know, helping to spread biogas. But, uh, and, you know, a friend encouraged me to come to this workshop on, on biochar. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a, you have to inoculate biochar. And I wonder, like, yeah, I wonder, like you said, there was something on one of your slides about low temp versus high temp um, biochar production. And you didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch it, but I didn't, I don't, didn't hear you speak much about like what the differences are between yeah. those two. And also, um, yeah, just, you know, I've, I've only made biochar in Costa Rica where we just use like, we use both the can and the mound method, you know, the earthen mound, which are very, very different. <laughs> different procedures than the one shown in your slide. So I'm very cognizant of, you know, not wanting to cause a huge, you know, carbon emission just from the production of the biochar. I'm also curious, like, yep. as I'm getting into this, this thinking, you know, like, to learn more about what I'd be working with if, if we were to do this on a small scale and a decentralized, in a decentralized way. Well, I, I, the, I can, a few uh, comments. Is, they have been burning uh, ag waste in California, for instance, from the, tr from the nut tree industry. That's sort of the common practice here. Um, and so it's not just Italy or, uh, uh, or the developing uh, economies, but it's, you know, it's an issue here. And there's a movement to begin to process that material into biochar. Um, there's several startups that are doing, you know, macadamia nuts and walnuts and, uh, and, and almond nuts. And, you know, that's a high density material makes a really great distinctive biochar. You mean uh, like shells or the branches? Well, the, initially they're, they're doing the shell. So they, so they're setting up for, uh, you know, there are these shelling co-ops. So they, they cut, bring all the nuts to one place and they shell them and they dry them and, and so forth. So there's big concentrations of material. Uh, it's, you know, they use it, they throw it down for road material and so forth. There's not, a, there's not really a, a market other than just to burn it for energy. Uh, most of the energy permits in California, biomass energy permits are getting pulled. So it's sort of like Maine that there's not a, you know, there's not an outlet for this low grade wood. Uh, there's not an outlet for this material. So that's so that's happening. Um, in terms of slow paralysis, that you know, that sort of is what I'm thinking about with small scale. Um, so it's uh, uh, you know cooler. It tends to run at a lower temperature. So your residency time in the kiln has to be longer in order to achieve that high carbon material. Um, and you know, and a lot of that just isn't high carbon biochar. Um, it, but also it's not necessarily high ash biochar. What you have is a not carbonized material. So in the soil, that will take quite a long time to break down. So, you know, you can have actually a short-term drop in soil fertility because you're, you know, if you, it's harder to inoculate because there's not, as, there's, not, there's not as much space to inoculate because there's, in essence, all those pores are filled with volatile organics that were there in the wood you know, before you or whatever you're processing. Uh, so you're actually, you know, you're gonna starve the soil for some period of time of, 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 um, of productivity. In the long term, you know, you're gonna be adding a lot of value to the soil. And so it just matters, you know, what you start with. Putting down- uh, What would the time frame be? Like, like a year of rest? Uh, it uh, depends on the amount of volatiles left in the material, but it can be two to three years. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's still, if you have degraded and compacted soil, that's still a good, it's still a very good thing to do uh, uh, relative to doing nothing at all. And in uh, much, it'll have higher impacts than just 
putting down compost um, because that's just a, a short, short lived um, uh, uh, solution to sort of degraded soils. Thank you. All right. Um, if everybody uh, has feels like they got the questions answered, I'm going to uh, end this Zoom meeting. Thank you all so much for attending.